Hello, everybody. We are going to be covering a great deal of ground today as we talk about some very, very important political developments that happened in the 1920s and 1930s um, between World War I and World War II. And uh, one of the very uh, important things that happened during this time was the development of the modern idea of totalitarianism and a totalitarian state. Um, and so before we go into what happened in Nazi Germany and the rest of Europe, uh, where a lot of these things centered, uh, we're going to talk about what kind of common principles these different systems had together. And uh, this is an important thing to understanding where we're going to be going as we study more about what happened that led up to World War II, which is one of the most significant events in, in human history. So uh, the, the countries that we're going to be looking at, at least briefly, we'll be looking more deeply into Nazi Germany, but also we're going to talk a little bit about the communist uh, USSR, which is the Soviet Union. We're going to talk about fascist Italy and Spain and uh, imperial Japan as well. So we'll get into those, all those a tiny bit. Um, important to remember here, first off, that totalitarianism uh, is a type of an authoritarian system, right? So dictatorships, monarchies, and other authoritarian systems, which mainly served the rulers, were in place for a long time. But this was a new concept. This is the idea of total control by the state for the state. Totalitarianism is an extreme authoritarian system where the government aims to control all aspects of life. Total surveillance, total control of citizens, total control of, of thought, of speech, of conduct. Um, it's an extreme version of authoritarianism, uh, social, economic, and cultural. It goes through all human aspects of human interaction in life. Uh, the symbol there, Big Brother is watching you, is, if you might not recognize it, from the book 1984, which if you have not read yet, you probably will be, um, by George Orwell. And that book is centered around a totalitarian system. Orwell was quite uh, critical of totalitarian systems and uh, was also so in the book Animal Farm, in which he was being critical of the uh, state communist system of the USSR as it developed under Stal Joseph Stalin, which we'll talk about. So um, touching in here, just to give you a good quote from one of the founders of this type of modern totalitarianism, Benito Mussolini, who was the fascist dictator of Italy in the mid 20th century, he said, he said that for fascism, which is this type of totalitarianism, is that everything within the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. So, uh, well, Benito here was definitely pretty good at covering the bases of what um, the philosophies were that he tried his best to embody. So social life, right? So social life refers to a person's interpersonal relationships as in who you fall in love with, who your family, extended family and friends are in your family, um, how you interact with people, where you go to party, what you do with your life, all the things that you do in your interpersonal relationships in life. Under totalitarianism, well, that's gonna be controlled by Big Brother, by the state. The state will certainly have a say in that. Economic, so economic life, that refers to a person's job, refers to the country's resources, um, the things that we do to make a living to be able to survive. Um, of course, as you would figure under totalitarianism, that's going to be tightly controlled by the state as well. Not a shocker. Um, the economy is oftentimes under the strong control of the state, which, depending on the type of system, as we will soon learn, could be in, co in uh, cooperation with some very big business interests or could be um, a radical communist change, which involves, um, in the case of state communist systems, total government control of industries. Also cultural life, that refers to the arts, including literature, journalism, entertainment, all of these things that are important that we uh, oftentimes take for granted in our society, right? Well, in a totalitarian system, those are certainly under the control or at least very watchful eye of the state. And if you get out of line, you might have somebody knocking on your door. So under a totalitarian state, it is generally considered to be a single party state where only one political party is legally permitted to operate. Oftentimes, of course, this party gets upwards of 99% of the vote. 
A uh, good example of that is the recent elections that have happened in Egypt, where only one political party was legally allowed to really uh, operate and be and campaign and be part of the ballot. So you'll see Abdul Sisi, Al Sisi, uh, the current dictator of Egypt. Well, um, I think he won his last election with something like 97 or 98 percent of the vote. Um, of course, that's a lot easier to get when there's only one party on the ballot. So what we need to do is think about a couple of prompts here, the first two prompts. What are some of the reasons that people might support a single party state? Okay, that's prompt number one. And prompt number two, can you think of a single party state that we studied the beginnings of earlier this year, just a few months back? We already mentioned Egypt, but I want you to think of another one that might be related to what we're talking about today. So take a couple minutes and write those prompts. Okay, you can unpause now. Um, some of the reasons people might support a single party state, of course, there's a lot of different reasons for that, right? But uh, stability is one that is often cited. Uh, people are tired of the conflict within state, within parties that have, uh, or states that have multiple parties, political and civil conflict and other arguments. Um, they might consider it to be a uh, fast track to economic stability. Maybe they happen to agree with the ruling party. Lots of reasons. Um, also, can you think of a single party state? Well, I can give you a hint. Uh, we're gonna be talking about that state today. And it was ruled for a while by a guy named Joseph Stalin. So uh, single party state is a state where only one political party is legally permitted to operate. And uh, these typically arise during periods of crisis. So people start to become more open to the idea of a totalitarian state in, in, a, in the middle of a war, in the aftermath of a war, during economic collapse, when things like starvation happen um, and other uh, desperate human measures, uh, religious or ethnic strife becomes extreme and intense and people are tired of strife within the society. Um, also deep social divisions or class conflict can uh, pave the way for a totalitarian state. These are all potential paths to this kind of rule. Um, so these end up with extreme measures, so crisis, leads to hopelessness, a fear for the future, or concerns about society descending into some kind of chaos. People may become attracted to extreme measures or to ideologies, which promise to restore hope, optimism, or order in everyday life. So down here, we have the flag of the Soviet Union, uh, which ended in the early 1990s, 1991. Uh, you also have here in the middle, you have the flag of fascist Italy. This is the symbol of fascist Italy, which we will talk about more in a little bit because it is a very uh, specific symbol, which has specific meaning. And over here is the symbol of the Nazi party, the swastika, which we will also talk about, about because it's kind of an important thing to talk about, the symbol itself and how um, there's some real inconsistencies in it. So actually, here's that symbol again, or a similar, similar one to it, right, to the Italian flag here. This is uh, called a phalange. And the idea of it is it is a bundle of sticks. It's a bundle of sticks. So in Italian, that's fascists. It's a bundle of sticks. And this is a symbol of a fascist, the fascist party of Italy. And then there's an axe that's embedded within that bundle of sticks, an axe handle, either here in the middle of it or here on the top. And so what's the thing with an axe handle that can happen if you try to snap it in half? Well, you can snap it in half, snap the handle in half, no, without too much trouble, right? If it's an axe handle that's going to be, you know, used for violence, maybe you're going to do that. Well, that becomes a lot more complicated once you've bound a bunch of other sticks around it, right? So in this case, the axe handle and the axe itself come to symbolize the power and rigidity and, uh, and potential violence of the state to enact its agenda, supported by the people wrapped around it in a solid uh, bond that help protect that. So we're going to look at some categories to analyze this. Uh, an analysis of the rise of a single party state can be divided into three categories. So that's the leader, the historical context, and the elimination of the opposition. These are really important to keep in mind here. Um, and a lot of these, the ideology of the state is key. It's the individual within the state, the person who lives in it, other than the leader is not important. So here's the leader, and let's talk about the, the leader a bit. 
The totalitarian states that were leading into World War II all developed a heroic, idealized image of their leader. This was called a cult of personality. Um, this, is a, this is Joseph Stalin, sometimes called Uncle Joe, during this period in the Soviet Union. And this is, uh, you remember that whole art movement that we talked about under the, uh, the, the earlier this week about constructivism, which was the Soviet art movement? Well, Joseph Stalin wasn't that much of a fan of constructivism, actually, because he felt like it was, uh, it gave too much artistic license and was too uh, bourgeois and a little bit too um, open to interpretation, shall we say. Shall we say. So he decided to, pi to uh, promote a new style when he took over control of the Soviet Union called Soviet realism, which was basically stuff like this that was like the classic idea of propaganda posters that we see. These posters that are supposed to project an idealized image of a state or a leader or some sort of other idea that's done in this kind of really clearly communicated way. Um, he actually ended up purging, it was just to say either killing or sending to Siberia uh, a number of the most notable constructivist artists. So number three, what are some things that might help turn a political leader into a larger than life heroic figure? I want you to think about that with prompt number three. Give it a right now. Okay, so I'm going to think there's a lot of different stuff that you could have for that, right? Um, could be dumb luck. Could be being in the right place at the right time. Could be uh, a lot of stamina. Could be uh, just the ability to really be able to speak to people and charisma, lots of different potential stuff, definitely a lot of ego, and definitely a lot of uh, desire for power. So here's some aspects that they're talking about, physical experience, charisma, strength and power, intelligence, spiritual depth, personal skills, writing, speaking, etc., all that, recruitment, recruitment of people, um, personal history, having some kind of a compelling personal history that ties into a national myth or some sort of a myth that they're promoting. Also motivation to do so and vision. So oftentimes these are people who don't sleep a lot. Um, people who are willing and able to really push an agenda that they want. Uh, this is Mussolini, by the way, down here. This is a uh, classic Italian fascist propaganda poster. Um, and this is a type of art form known as futurism, which is related to objectivism. You can see how they're standing up here. This is part of their conquest of Africa, North Africa, that the Italians got into. We'll get into that. So under totalitarianism, the leader must present this image of ideology. So again, ideology is key here. This is broad principles and vision, some sort of a specific set of ideas and principles that they want to push. Um, and the individual underneath this in the society is not important. The leader, however, is important. Also a political platform. A specific plan. So in this one, um, hit, this is one, a classic one of Hitler from, uh, classic's a strong word, this is a, an old one for Hitler from, uh, from Germany when the German, um, when he was still in the path of coming to power. And this is kind of showing this classic traditional ideal of German uh, folk power, German Volk, as he, he would call it. Um, and this is like this kind of medieval image of Germany as this conquering, powerful, traditional nation. And this is a castle at Nuremberg, which is often considered to be, was considered by the Nazis to be the spiritual center of their nation. It was kind of in a more rural part of the country and was considered to be where the, the Volk, the people were really centered. So let's talk about some of these guys here. There's Stalin, right? Stalin was in the USSR. Um, that was the Soviet Union, and Stalin actually took over after Lenin died in 1924. He was ruthless. Uh, he conducted countless purges of his political opponents. Uh, many, many thousands of people were killed or sent away into exile. Uh, he was notorious also for a, an event called the Holo Holodomir, which was in 1932 to 1933. That uh, was a combination of a bad drought, um, his hostility and indifference to the suffering of uh, the independence-minded people of the Soviet area of the Ukraine, and the uh, forced Soviet collectivization of private farms, which is part of the uh, the program and ideology that he was uh, trying to push, is was taking away private farms and putting them into big collectives, which was a failed experiment and just didn't didn't work well to be able to produce uh, for the people 
at the time. And this led to the starvation, this combination of things. Uh, a lot of his, you know, the, at best, his indifference and uh, hostility to these people led to the starvation and deaths of several million Ukrainian people. And this is in 1932 to 33. In Spain, there's Francisco Franco. He was a fascist general. Uh, he led his phalangist party in the brutal Spanish Civil War against the democratic Spanish national government. Also, he was fighting against communist, socialist, and anarchist forces. And, and this is in 1936 to 1939. Um, he was definitely not in the majority with his forces. He, was, he had about the support of somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of the people. But like those other bundles of sticks, he really held his people together. Um, this Spanish Civil War was widely considered to be a dress rehearsal for World War II because uh, he also had the support of not only the some of the wealthiest people in Spain and big industrialists, but he also was backed by the Italian and German fascist governments with weapons and air support. Uh, there were thousands of anti-fascist fighters from all over the world, actually, that came to Spain to try to fight uh, this movement. But uh, the people from the United States even were coming from that. They came to fight Franco, but in the end they lost, uh, largely because there was so much money and power being directed especially from the fascist governments of uh, Europe at that point to support him, the uh, Germans helped bombing campaigns and so on. Uh, Spain remained officially neutral in World War II and Franco ruled with an iron fist because they were neutral, they weren't defeated in the war. So he ruled with an iron fist until his death in 1975. Spain was a fascist country until 1975. In Japan, Emperor Hirohito, who was more of a figurehead, but was an important symbol for the nation, uh, was the uh, throne, and then the power behind the throne were the generals, primarily Hideki Tojo in Japan. Uh, now, Japan was also a very powerful totalitarian state, and uh, Tojo uh, considered it to be Japan's destiny to rule over all of Asia. Uh, as we learned about in the brutal Japanese occupation of Korea, this was not going to go over very easily or very well. And uh, there was a lot of fighting and resistance and a lot of brutality on Japan's part. Um, Tojo presided over the rape of Nanking in China, an incredible atrocity in 1937 in which over 300,000 people were killed, mostly civilians. And here's Mussolini himself, Benito Mussolini of Italy. Um, he was a former socialist, actually, who came up with the ideas that formed the core of fascism, the the philosophy that came to be known as fascism. And under fascism, inequality is natural and violent conquest is desired. That's a desired attribute for nationalists, these hyper-nationalist regimes. Uh, Mussolini felt that the government and big business should merge together in partnership, something that he called corporatism. Uh, Mussolini wanted to blaze a path for what he considered to be a new Roman empire. And he presided over the ruthless invasion, conquest, and massacre of tens of thousands of people in Ethiopia, the largest remaining independent African nation following the scramble for Africa during the colonial era. Um, Adolf Hitler over here on the right, well, we're gonna be hearing a lot more about him. And oh, here he is. But first off, let's talk about some basics here. There are some very different types of totalitarianism in here. Um, state communism is what we consider, we'd consider to be on the left wing of the political spectrum. Uh, the remember, state communism is not the same as Marxist communism, as the communism envisioned as an ideal state by Karl Marx. This is a different thing. This is the being kind of stuck in the dictatorship of the proletariat. But in this case, the proletariat is being distilled down to uh, one or two people. So maybe kind of a different thing. Um, it's a totalitarian one-party system either being ruled by a single ruler like Stalin was, or by a small politburo, a, a uh, oligarch, oligarchy type rule, essentially. Um, this system implies government ownership under the dictatorship of the proletariat type here. It implies government ownership of means of production and land. So that means that all the, all the private industry is owned by the government and land is owned by the government and distributed e equally in theory um, there is social and economic equality for all citizens. And in many of the societies, it is true, including the Soviet Union, um, people lived relatively uh, equal lives. A, a doctor uh, who was a famous doctor would get paid around the same as a factory worker, as would somebody who was um, in the Politburo, although the person in the Politburo 
might also get a lot of perks and maybe get a really fancy apartment. Also, they would have a lot of power. Um, there's also social equality. So people were not considered to be, you know, again, the equality was the goal here. And in the end goal, the idea was that the state would wither away and everybody would be equal. Although, again, power has a tendency to corrupt, right? Um, and under communism, remember, the emphasis is on conflict, conflict between the classes. So the enemies here were the rich. They were those who, who, who the capitalists, those who hoarded the wealth. And the idea was that they should spread the revolution internationally and the world would come together in communist revolution for an equal state for all workers. Um, this is different from a fascist state, which is a right-wing totalitarianism. Uh, a fascist state is a totalitarian one-party system with a godlike leader, a cult leader, um, essentially, like Mussolini or, or Hitler, these political cults. Um, and that leader is worshipped for who they were rather than just attributes. They're just, overall, they were considered to be almost like a god. Um, private ownership of the means of production and land. So in fact, the inequalities that were tied up in capitalism uh, were for the most part considered to be natural. They were considered to be the proper way of things. And that uh, the people who were being promoted by this fascist state, who were the powerful people, were the ones who were going to be privately owning and profiting from these means of production from the factories and, and industries and from the land. And uh, social and economic inequality was actually seen as natural law. That does not mean that some people did not get stuff taken away from them. For instance, in Nazi Germany, people who were um, Jewish and who were identified as other enemies of the state for various reasons would be, have all these things taken away from them and repossessed by other powerful people because they were not considered to be part of the favored group that would be considered part of this nation. So this fascist state, this idea of a fascist state is strongly nationalist, tied into an identity around a nation, whether that is by borders or cultural or otherwise, or racial. Um, it's also, these are all, almost all fascist states are very macho and misogynist. They are oppressive to women. Um, they're focused on violence and conquest. Uh, by nations, by powerful nations, or superior races, quote-unquote superior races of people. Um, of course, those superior races are determined to be superior by those who run the fascist state and those who promote it. Um, it's also important, some important aspects of this type of totalitarianism are the distortion of information and uh, propaganda. Um, so number four, I want you to think about, prompt number four, what types of people or social economic classes might these different totalitarian systems appeal to and why? Pause and write. Okay, well, if you guess that those that those people who were the, they were appealing to um, under fascism, the idea that it would be appealing more to those who already had some power and had an identification with this kind of national identity, um, you were right. And oftentimes, uh, that would end up sometimes being people who might not have a lot of economic power, but might have a higher social status or cultural status, um, especially by race or religion. Um, under state communism, for instance, things are a little different, right? That's going to be that's going to be appealing to uh, to people who are in the working class, and that idea that ideally is that that's a working class. That's a universal concept, not tied into um, an identity within that working class, some kind of national identity that's really specific. So we're going to talk about Hitler because it's really important to understand what happened with Hitler and the uh, basics of who he was because it drove why World War II happened, especially the way it did. Um, Adolf Hitler was born in Austria and German in 1889. Uh, many historians believe that Hitler suffered physical abuse from his mother or his father, and grew strongly attached to his mother. Uh, his father really didn't like him all that much and disapproved of his life choices as a kid. Uh, he was artistically inclined, and his father really didn't like that. His father wanted him to go into being a clerk like him. Um, please note that Austrian Germans, like remember, Austria is a German-speaking country, even though it's a different country. And uh, German nationalism among Austrian Germans is very common. Many of the German Austrians resented the Habsburg dynasty in Germany. It was declining and they didn't like its rule over this ethnically varied empire. They wanted to be part of this German unified nation that had a German identity. 
um, yeah, Hitler, Hitler's father was, uh, was not very healthy either. And, uh, he was not in very good health and Hitler's younger brother, who was also not very health, again, very good health. He actually got measles young and died. And, uh, this profoundly affected Hitler's personality and education. Uh, when he died, he became Hitler became Adolf Hitler became so and detached and defiant. He was fighting with his father and with his teachers. He didn't want to follow his father into a career in the customs office, but he wanted to uh, attend a classical high school to become an artist. And uh, Adolf rebelled by intentionally doing poorly in technical school. He later wrote about this in his biography, autobiography, Mein Kampf, or his memoir. Um, his he ended up after his father's death moving to Vienna in 1905. And lived as a bohemian, which is like a kind of urban nomad and an aspiring painter. Um, his applications to the Academy of Fine Arts were rejected twice. He wasn't particularly good. There's a picture of uh, Adolf Hitler as a teenager. So then we came up to World War One, right? So uh, Hitler ended up in, you know, he ended up signing up for the German military, he ended up signing for the German military during World War One, not the Austrian. He wanted to fight for the Germans because he considered himself to be more of a German. And uh, he actually moved to, to Munich in 1913 to avoid constrict conscription in the Austrian army. So he ended up, um, he wanted up because he wanted to fight for the Germans. So he became a corporal um, and he was actually temporarily blinded, blinded by, by gas in the Battle of the Somme in October 1916. And he also got some shrapnel in his uh, thigh. Uh, and he was just kind of a mess. Actually, sorry, in 1916, he got the shrapnel in his thigh. And then he returned to service. And then he was blinded in 1918. So he he definitely kept fighting. Um, he learned of Germany's defeat while he was uh, while he was near the close of the war and when he was actually still blinded by gas. And his shock at the defeat worsened his condition. He, uh, he came to blame civilian leaders of Germany and communist Jews, what he called communist Jews for the defeat. This was the uh, stab in the back myth that was starting to be spread around. And these were the folks later to be called the November criminals by people around the time of the Treaty of Versailles. Um, Hitler was really obsessed with the anti-Semitic aspect, anti aspects of this. Meantime, the newly formed post-war Weimar Republic, which was democracy, was plagued from the outside by both internal and external problems, or from the outset, sorry, not the outside, but it was plagued from the beginning. Uh, internally, there was economic instability furthered by conflict between various political factions on the left and right. There were com the Communist Party, there were a bunch of socialist parties, um, there were the centrist parties, there were conservative parties. It's a big, uh, big complicated parliament. And... Uh, the uh, externally, Germany's relationship continued to strain among other world powers, particularly France, which you'll remember had taken big chunks of Germany's territory, and Belgium, who were demanding some payments back for so much of their territory being uh, trashed during World War One. So I want you to think about prompt number five now. Do you think a person's experiences in childhood, that's to say up to 14 or so, or do you think their experiences in the late teen years and early adulthood are more important in formulating their view on the world? What do you think? What's more important? Pause. Okay, unpause. There's a lot of potential answers for this. I'm sure you came up with something interesting. Um, so here's a photo of the German Free Corps militia, which was something that was going on. These guys are actually all veterans of World War I. They were brigades of nationalist, unemployed young soldiers. They were uh, left adrift as the armed services disbanded, there were up to 100,000 people in these brigades, who were, which were organized to fight uh, political left-wing groups. They were fiercely anti-communist. There was bleed over with other extreme right-wing groups, especially the strongly anti-Semitic ones who were pushing this stab in the back myth. Uh, these groups blamed Jews for Germany's World War I defeat and claimed they had masterminded the communist revolution in Russia, and they were trying to do the same thing in Germany. Uh, the Free Corps assassinated the Jewish foreign, foreign minister, Walter Rathenau, in 1922. Conservative German judges tended to treat these right-wing groups leniently, although they gave harsher sentences, much harsher sentences, to left-wing groups who were also radical. Um, the Free Corps was also important in a more sinister way. As the Nazi party began to grow, it began to absorb other right-wing groups. Uh, Hitler refused to allow his Nazis to become part of another larger organization, so as people began to see the Nazis as a viable party, 
many in the free corps would eventually join what was called the SA, the Sturmbeitlung, becoming foot soldiers and fit Hitler's campaign for power. I want you to think in prompt number six right now. Why do you think many German veterans were anti-communist? This is kind of a review of what you just heard. Pause. Okay, so if you need to go back over that, you can go and take a listen again to the couple minutes before it. So the early German Workers' Party, this was what the uh, Nazi Party was before it was the Nazi Party. So after he uh, he got out of his bout with blindness, Hitler came out and joined a new small right-wing political group called the German Workers' Party and soon became its leader because he was super charismatic. Um, and he had really good speaking skills. He was really ambitious and very energetic. Um, and this was formed to counterbalance workers' attraction to the growing Communist Party during the interwar period. It was to attract what they saw as uh, workers who were more invested in this idea of a national German identity rather than the international working person-oriented Communist Party. Um, so by 1920, the German Workers' Party ended up becoming the uh, National Socialists, the Nazis. Uh, quick note here that's really important. The Nazis were not socialists. Again, I will say it very emphatically, the Nazis were not socialists. Socialists believed in greater equality between people. The Nazis became, before too long, a fascist party, which was invested very deeply in inequality. So that's just a very important thing to keep in mind. Um, so this, this party was pretty, you know, pretty mean. They were really into uh, street fights. They instigated a lot of fights with communists and social democrats, socialists, and other right-wing extremist groups. Um, and they even got a youth brigade called the Hitler Youth in 1922, uh, ages 14 to 18. Meantime, there were public dissatisfaction with the centrist political parties of the Weimar Republic, and those grew stronger with events like the hyperinflation of 1923. This is when uh, the currency basically became, it became less and less valuable until it became totally worthless as Germany was trying to uh, figure out a way out of paying all the reparations from the Treaty of Versailles. So the German, German currency was worth basically nothing, and this cleaned out a lot of people's life savings. Uh, this made political parties on the extreme ends of the spectrum, both far left and far right, more appealing because many people wanted radical change and they were now becoming poor and desperate. So here's a poster from, uh, from this, uh, this period from the, from, from the National, so from the uh, Nazi party. Against corruption, vote for National Socialists, Hitler movement. Um, yeah, this is showing their kind of like glorification of the uh, of the workers. It says against corruption. They denounced the Weimar government for its what they saw as its corrupt use of state power to enrich its leaders while robbing the German people. Uh, Nazi propagandists portrayed their party as the guardians of the people. So this is represented by an industrial and an agricultural worker. Uh, so this is a classic Nazi poster. Um, also, National Socialism, the organized will of the nation. Um, this is uh, in the struggle to seize power. These propagandists who were making these posters sought to win the more, what they called the moral contest by portraying its stormtroopers who had been wounded in street brawls right here, like this guy with his bandage. Uh, with communists and socialists, they saw them as victims rather than instigators. And uh, bandaged Nazi warriors became a standard image in newspapers, films, and posters like this. Uh, many uh, in the German middle classes were terrified of communism, and they uncritically accepted this view of the Nazi as the courageous victim of leftist terror, which uh, at the time those forces were and became continued to be known as Antifa, anti-fascist. Um, and they actively fought the Nazis. So um, quick note on the on the swastika here in the background. I just want to get it out of the way. Many cultures have used the swastika for thousands of years. However, today it comes to, it's come to mean something very distinct in our context, thanks to the history of what has happened with the Nazis. And uh, the Nazis used it because uh, there's research that were, was done by German archeologists um, who associated it with weird eugenicist ideas of these proto-Indo-Europeans linking German people to the glorious past of world's great ancient civilizations like Rome and Greece and Mesopotamia and Persia and stuff. Uh, then the Nazis elaborated on it and considered it a symbol of the Aryan race. 
a five-part superior culture with a Nordic master race originating in Northern Europe, the other four, blah, blah, blah. As an anthropologist, somebody who studied as an anthropologist, I can tell you this is all rubbish. It's garbage. People mix all over the place. There's no such thing as a pure-blooded anyone. We have differences in appearance, which are called phenotypes, but we share so many genes that people who look nothing like each other on the outside may be near identical genetically. The Nazi race science was garbage. Culture and upbringing are very different, of course, and race matters because it's a social construct and it matters in our societies. But none of this is the racial science that the Nazis and other social Darwinists use to try to justify oppression of one group by another. Just want to get that out of the way. So in the early years of the Nazi party here, right, Hitler took out an ad for the pay in the paper for an uprising, which later became known as the Beer Hall Putsch of 1923. Uh, this is the first use of the Nazi paramilitary brown shirts, or the Sturmbeitlung, the SA. Um, from this point, the Nazis were specifically speaking out against communism and in favor of German hypernationalism, with the Treaty of Versailles becoming a symbol for how far the country had fallen, um, in their opinion. So this was a riot, uh, and uh, they ended up having a, uh, a, big, a big battle on the streets. Uh, this is in Bavaria, uh, Italy, which is a conservative region, and he thought they would get a lot of support. It didn't actually end up getting much support from people or from uh, conservative local officials who he had tried to convince to be part of his, his coup. Um, and so they backed out. So they, there was a big fight. But in the end, uh, they, these folks got arrested because it was a, it was a mess and uh, because he was trying to overthrow the government. So Bavarian police arrested him. Hitler was arrested and convicted of sedition, insurrection against the government, uh, given a sentence of five years in prison, which he only served one year of. And uh, he wrote his manifesto slash autobiography, Mein Kampf, in there. Uh, mein Kampf is a hot mess. Uh, that framed the, uh, the Nazi party's ideology, uh, presented his political theories. It was all grounded in racism, uh, which was itself grounded in the pseudoscientific distortions of social Darwinism and eugenics that we talked about a minute ago. This is the center of Hitler's philosophy, especially anti-Semitism. He believed the Germans were the Aryan master race destined to rule the world and that Jews were poisoning the blood and culture of the German people. Um, Again, a note, Mein Kampf is a hot mess and largely unreadable. So here's a poster. Um, this is an interesting one. Women, millions of men without work, millions of children without a future. Save the German family. Vote for Adolf Hitler. So you can see, again, this is this appeal to this national, very specific national identity, a racial identity, and a German identity, um, especially carved out and aimed at a German middle class, very, very uh, clearly here in a poster like this. Here is a, uh, a classic, the classic kind of totalitarian view, and this is actually where the, the uh, Big Brother image from um, 1942 came from, was this poster of, of Hitler, uh, Modern Techniques of Propaganda, which included strong images and simple messages helped propel Austrian-born Adolf Hitler from being a little-known extremist to being one of the leading candidates for Germany's presidency in 1932. Uh, Heinrich Hoffmann, Hitler's official photographer, created this 1932 election poster. The style of this poster is eerily similar to so those of some film stars of the era, especially Charlie Chaplin, who really didn't like Hitler stealing his mustache idea. Charlie Chaplin was a communist, by the way. He was also Roma. Uh, he was a he was a, uh, a Roma person, which is a, the term you will sometimes hear the term gypsy to describe him. That's Charlie Chaplin, who I'm talking about, the film star. And uh, Roma were heavily persecuted in the concentration camps by Hitler. Anyway, getting on to chancellorship, which is to say, um, it's sort of like a prime minister in Britain or a mixture of the Speaker of the House and the majority leader in the Senate. It's different from the president in the U.S., which is a separate office. This is like somebody who controls the whole legislative branch of Germany. So in early 1932, Germany's economy was suffering from the Great Depression, 30% unemployment. And then in April 1932, Hitler almost won the presidential election against 85-year-old President Hindenburg. Um, 
Hitler had only been a German citizen since February and was actually only eligible to run for office since then. But uh, he was running against Hindenburg, who was actually a conservative. He was pretty right-wing, but not a fascist. And Hindenburg had been president since 1925. Uh, Hindenburg won, but only after Hitler forced him into a runoff election. And that's a second round of voting done because Hindenburg failed to get 50% the first time. So the the national the Nazis got 37% of the, seat, the seats in the Reichstag, way more than any party other party had in the Weimar Republic's history since everything was so mixed up. Um, this poster here says Marxism is the guardian angel of capitalism. Vote National Socialist. Actually, no, I'm sorry. This is a this is a different one. This is a this is the National. Um, my apologies. Yeah, this is the vote National Socialist. So this is basically aiming to taint workers' positive views on communism and socialism. This is showing this glorified worker. And there's another poster on this same theme coming up in a moment. You can see caricatures below, particularly of uh, of Jewish people, these like kind of derogatory caricatures to this. Um, so in this, Hindenburg actually thought that uh, after Hitler, Hitler took the chancellorship, the president, Hindenburg, thought that he could control Hitler by surrounding him with more moderate politicians. So what he did was he appointed him chancellor, even though he didn't win a majority, he appointed him chancellor in January of 1933. So remember, the NSDAP won this big uh, number of seats, but not an outright majority. And nobody else wanted to vote for Hitler to be chancellor, but Hindenburg felt that he could control him. And so he appointed him as chancellor, a historic and, and very nasty mistake. What do you see in this picture of Hitler and President Hindenburg? What's, what's the body language like? What do you think is happening? Why? Pause. Prop number six. There's a lot going on, right? There's military in the background. Hindenburg's obviously dressed in military gear, but Hitler is not. He's wearing a suit. He's got a very, he's got this different style and he's also looking down, right? He's showing deference to Hindenburg. That's not going to last for long. Before long, Hitler was going to become what is called the Führer, which is the leader of Germany. On February 27, 1933, there was a massive fire at the Reichstag, the Weimar Capitol building. Burned the Reichstag down in the middle of the night. Hitler and the Nazis accused the communists of doing it. Uh, though some Germans, actually many, believe the Nazis said it themselves, and uh, they probably did. And Hitler enacted some emergency acts to help, quote, protect Germany from the communists. In the elections the following week, the Nazis won controlling power in the parliament, partially by making it very difficult for communists to vote and locking them out of the elections. And they passed laws to allow the Nazi party to bypass the president and opponents in the parliament. So they won the election following the word fire in the Reichstag, which outraged a lot of German citizens. Meanwhile, President Hindenburg died of old age on August 2, 1934, and Hitler used the opportunity to merge the offices of the chancellor and president, anointing himself the first Führer, which is to say the supreme leader of Germany. Um, Hindenburg had been this noble guy uh, from a Prussian family. He was the supreme commander of the German army in World War I. He was very symbolically important. So it would have been difficult for Hitler to actually just remove him from power. Um, so this was an ideal time for him to die of old age. Um, so he was, uh, yeah, he he was gone. So this was uh, this was the the paving for Hitler. Um, this is the burning of the Reichstag. It's people watching the Reichstag burn. So this is the enabling law. Uh, the Nazi-controlled Reichstag passed this enabling law, which gave him total power. And then within a year of him getting total power and merging these offices, all political parties other than the Nazis are banned. President Hindenburg, as we noted, died of old age. And Hitler, uh, as we mentioned, merged the chancellorship and presidency. So the supreme leader, this was, uh, this was it. So there was Nazi rule in Germany, totalitarian society in the 1930s. Nazi economic development policies were very popular with the German public through the 1930s. Hitler purged, which is to say executed or imprisoned, his political opponents en masse, thousands and thousands and thousands, soon to become millions. Political opponents, it was in the tens of thousands. 
uh, music, art, and literature were legally required to reflect Nazi party ideology. Meanwhile, what the Nazis considered to be deviant music, art, and culture are prohibited. By the way, this is again Nuremberg, this kind of like uh, idealized Nazi uh, city of this mythical German identity. So I want you to think about number seven here, prompt number seven. What kind of music, art, and literature do you think would be allowed by the Nazis, and what do you think would be banned as deviant or degenerate? Here's your hint. Think about the stuff that you learned about in the lecture earlier in the week about art styles. And pause. Well, you had a lot to work with there, right? One would guess that probably Dada and Surrealism weren't very well looked upon. One would guess that uh, even things like Bauhaus actually didn't do that well because they had too much of an independent streak. Um, obviously, we're seeing some ideas of what kind of stuff the Nazis did like. Uh, because I want you to think about what kind of ways approved our art, music, or literature might reflect Nazi ideology, right? Because that's probably what's going on here. How are they going to do that? What's approved? What's going to be approved? Well, here's stuff that's not approved. So over here, we have John Hartfield, aka John Hersfeld, doing some stuff that's actually um, very critical of the Nazis. Uh, but, but hooray, the butter is all gone. So, you know, there's no food, but hey, everybody's eating all these weapons that the Nazi party is, uh, is making as they starve. There's Hitler in the background. As you could probably guess, uh, John Hartfield was not in the country at this point. He was exiled. There's a baby chewing on an axe. That's that's a charming picture. Um, Marianne Brandt, all the stuff, uh, the, a lot of the Bauhaus stuff, which was considered to be very futurist and global in scope, was considered to be deviant. There's a lot of race mixing going on here, right? And other things that the Nazis would not consider to be uh, to be worth their their positive attention. So these things would be banned. That's another Hartfield poster right here. The Another one of those critical, critical of Nazism and excessive automation. Hitler's totalitarian rule, more of this. Here's some stuff that you might see. Look at all these Hitler things, right? Lots and lots of, lots of Hitler art. So many variations on Hitler art. Here's Hitler looking pensively off in the distance. Hitler heiling. Hitler looking focused and determined. Hitler in soft focus. Hitler with some dark shading. Bust of Hitler, bunch of little stained glass Hitlers, lots of Hitler. Part of this stuff was pushed by old Joseph Goebbels, who was the Minister for Public Entertainment and Propaganda, very much a nobody and a failed director uh, before the revolution, but ended up ingratiating himself with Hitler and uh, ended up orchestrating all public events and controlling all information and uh, yeah, he created some of the most um, notorious pieces of propaganda in film and visually ever known to humans. Book burnings, which is one of his master strokes, began in 1933, again in Nuremberg, which was this uh, center of the Nazi spiritual universe. Uh, they burned books that they thought acted subversively on our future or strike at the roots of German thought, which I'm sure you can imagine would be quite a few books in the world. Um, as Goebbels stated, the soul of the German people can again express itself. These flames of the books not only illuminate the final end of an old era, they light up a new. A description by an American living in Germany at the time uh, was talking about the book All Quiet on the Western Front, which was a very famous book uh, dealing with the end of World War I and uh, with a strong pacifist message. And... Uh, he talked about how it received the greatest condemnation. It would never do for such an unheroic description of war to dishearten soldiers of the Third Reich. So I want you to think about which is more offensive, burning a book or burning your nation's flag. Why? Take a pause. Again, this is going to be very personal, but uh, I want you to think about it from your own perspective and Think about how this how this all worked. So continuing on, and what we're going to be re you're going to be reading about over the next day or so, we're going to talk about the Nuremberg Laws in 1935. The Nuremberg Laws of 1935 prohibited marriage or sexual relations between Jews, 
and Aryans, what they consider to be Aryans, defined by law now. And they stripped anyone, um, anyone one quarter Jewish or more of their citizenship from Germany. This led to increased Jewish prosecution. And this progressed in stages. It didn't start out with everybody being thrown into concentration camps. It isn't how it worked. It isn't like Hitler came to power and suddenly all the Jews are in concentration camps or everybody in general. It was in stages, slowly, like a frog boiling slowly in water. Um, Jews were identified by these laws and citizenship was called into question. Loyalty was called into question. They were attacked in the street. There was racial violence that was not officially sanctioned, but would happen. Jewish prosecution continued. Segregation. Soon they started getting segregated into ghettos, first informal and then official. And then they started getting deported to other countries and to other places. The concentration camp internments began in late 1933, but it wasn't with, the, with Jewish people at first. It was actually with communists and other enemies of, uh, political enemies of the, um, the Nazis. And eventually that began, began over stages to expand to other enemies of the state, which uh, they, deter they determined. And again, that included eventually, you know, Jews. This included at the time socialists, also Roma, the uh, so-called, the slur for them is gypsies. And again, I'll note that Charlie Chaplin, who uh, was a British, enormous British movie star who uh, Hitler admired his style and copied his mustache, was actually a Roma. Um, the disabled, disabled people, he didn't know, but Hitler didn't know he was Roma. Um, disabled people were very early put into the camps. Uh, Homosexuals were very early put into the camps. Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, which is a sect of Christianity, which tend to be anti-government. Um, asocial, what they would call asocial people and deviants, which could mean a lot of different things, including artists, uh, many artists, and people who are, you know, deemed to be asocial, who are deemed to not have good, you know, interactions with the state and with people around them. Also Jews which came later, and then also Slavs and other non-Aryans. So uh, Russians living within the country and Slavic people, but lots and lots of people ended up in the camps. The pink triangle, by the way, is the symbol for, um, for homosexuals, and that's why you see the pink triangle when you see gay liberation movements. It's actually the symbol they, the Nazis would put onto homosexuals uh, who would be put into the concentration camps, eventually to be exterminated. These are actually um, gay men being led to the concentration camps. Here's a poster showing the different symbols of people they would sew onto their concentration camp uniforms to identify them by why they were being um, why they were being imprisoned. So as you think about this and look at it, I want you to uh, think about these things as you do your assignment today on the Nuremberg Laws and answer the questions. Thanks so much for your attention. I know this is a long one and I appreciate you.